Welcome back. And now for the news in detail. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel says the conditions in which the people of occupied Kashmir are living are unsustainable and must be improved. Speaking to reporters in New Delhi, Merkel said she would raise the issue in a meeting with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I would like to hear the arguments of the Prime Minister today. The current situation of the people there is not sustainable and not good. That certainly needs to be improved. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan says nothing can deny Kashmiris their freedom from Indian occupation. Speaking in Gilgit, marking the region's Independence Day, Khan said India has played its last card by revoking Kashmir's special status. He said millions of Kashmiris have been confined to their homes by 900,000 Indian troops. The Prime Minister said New Delhi will witness a rejuvenated resolve for freedom in occupied Kashmir the day the lockdown is lifted. The Prime Minister said Gilgit Baltistan's resilience against Dogra regime led to their liberation from Indian oppression. Pakistan has waived off the $20 processing fee for Sikh pilgrims coming through the Kartarpur corridor. Prime Minister Imran Khan says the step is a welcoming gesture for the pilgrims. The relief was extended to devotees visiting Pakistan for the celebration of the 550th birthday of Guru Nanak Dev. This one-time waiver will be for the day of inauguration on the Guru Nanak's birthday. Islamabad has also relaxed the conditions of getting a passport for identification and prior registration for the visitors. The visiting six won't need a passport, just a valid ID, and they won't need to register 10 days in advance. U.S., which has imposed fresh sanctions on Iran's construction sector. The U.S. State Department says the curbs will also hit a trade in four materials used for Tehran's military and nuclear programs. U.S. State Department spokesman Morgan Otagas said the latest sanctions will help preserve oversight of Iran's civil nucle nuclear program. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said Tehran's construction sector is controlled by the Revolutionary Guard Corps. He said the sanctions will reduce proliferation risks and constrain Iran's ability to build a nuclear weapon. The U.S. has grounded its fleet of Chinese-made drones to conduct a review of the program. China's foreign ministry has hit back, calling the U.S. move discriminatory. Interior Department spokesman Nick Goodwin said any UAVs made from Chinese components have been grounded. Goodwin gave no reason for the decision, but it comes amid U.S. security concerns over Chinese electronics. Over 800 aircraft have been grounded under the review program. Goodwin said exceptions would be made for drones being used for emergency purposes. He said the department will review any potential security risks the drone could pose. Moving on to Palestine, where Israel has approved the construction of over 2,000 illegal settlements in the occupied West Bank. Settlement watchdog Peace Now has revealed Tel Aviv took the decision on October the 10th. Peace Now says the settlement construction has increased under Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. All settlements are considered illegal under international law and are a violation of the UN's two-state solution. Netanyahu is currently fighting for his political survival after failing to form a coalition government after elections in September. He pledged to annex the West Bank during election campaign, received widespread condemnation and rejection. Turkish and Russian troops have begun their first joint ground patrols in northeast Syria. This follows a last month's deal between the two countries that forced Kurdish fighters to withdraw from a proposed safe zone. Turkey's defense ministry said the ground and air units started patrol from the border town of Darbasya and that it will cover an area of 110 kilometers. Meanwhile, Turkey has freed 18 Syrian soldiers captured inside the proposed safe zone. The Defense Ministry said the troops were captured on Tuesday near the key border town of Ras al Ain. It said the decision to release soldiers was made after talks with Russia. The European Union has allocated an additional 600 million euros in financial aid to support refugees in Turkey. In a statement, it said the sum has been allocated under the Social Harmony Assistance Programme supervised by the Red Crescent. The bloc uh, says another 63 million euros have been allocated to fund basic service projects. These include education, health, food and infrastructure. 
The Social Honey Assistance Program gives 22 euros per month on Red Crescent cards to needy families living outside camps. At a Turkey-EU summit in 2015, the EU pledged a 3 billion euro fund for Syrians in Turkey. U.S. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan has reported an all-time high number of civilian casualties for a three-month period. Sigar, citing U.N. records, said it recorded 42% increase in civilian casualties in the third quarter of 2019. The report said over 1,100 civilians were killed and over 3,100 wounded in past three months only. It said Afghan Special Security Forces led operations contributed to 54% civilian deaths. It also noted an increase in IED attacks against coalition forces during this quarter. Lebanon's President Michel Aoun says he wants to transform the country from a sectarian system to a civil state. Following the resignation of Prime Minister Saad al hariri amid nationwide protests against a sectarian elite blamed for mishandling the economy, the President called for the formation of a new government of technocrats. He said ministers should be chosen according to their competencies and not political loyalties. The country's sectarian-based political system divides power among all 18 sects. In Algeria, thousands of protesters took to the streets in Algiers for the 37th consecutive week to protest against the ruling elite. The week's demonstrations coincided with the anniversary of the 1954 revolution against the French colonial rule. Protesters are demanding the removal of former President Abdul Aziz Bouteflika's allies before any new election. They are also calling for the release of all opposition leaders arrested during anti-government demonstrations. Algeria descended into political uncertainty after the ouster of former President Bouteflika in April. The country is scheduled to elect a new president on 12th of December. Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez says government will not allow Catalonia to seek online independence. This follows his efforts to control separatist groups and parties' activity on the internet. In an interview, Sanchez said there would be no independence for Catalonia, either offline or online. The Spanish government has adopted a decree to oblige all public administrations to host their websites in the European Union. Separatist politicians have set up the online Catalan Republican Council, claiming to have 80,000 followers. Meanwhile, hundreds of students have blocked the streets in Barcelona, calling for Catalan independence. A large group of students marched through the streets to San Juame Square outside the regional government headquarters. In Chile, the death toll in the continuing anti-government protest has risen to 23. The Chilean prosecutor's office says five people have been killed in the clashes with the security forces, while two died in custody. The justice ministry says more than 9,200 people have been arrested across the country. Demonstrators say they plan more protests on the weekend, demanding the resignation of President Sebastian Pinera. The protest started over new taxes imposed by Pinera's government. In Bolivia, political tensions have escalated after opposition leader Carlos Mesa rejected the third-party audit of the election results. The election gave President Evo Morales a controversial fourth term. Mesa said no audit based on unilaterally agreed terms will be acceptable. He demanded the results be set aside and ballots be recounted from scratch by the Organization of American States Mission. President Evo Morales has called for a truce, saying the 30-member mission of the international body is non-partisan. Post-election violence over disputed results left two people dead and 140 injured. In the Philippines, 19 people have been killed after a truck plunged into a ravine in northern Apayao province. Police say 22 others have been wounded in the accident. They say most of the passengers were farmers. The vehicle fell backward down a hill into the 20-meter deep ravine.
A man from Northern Ireland has been charged with manslaughter after 39 bodies were found in a lorry container in Essex last week. 23-year-old Eamon Harrison is also facing human trafficking and unlawful immigration charges. Harrison was arrested at Dublin port last week after taking a ferry from France. He is the second person to be charged in relation to the tragedy. He will face an extradition hearing later this month. In Baytown, police have arrested two people and summoned others for questioning on suspicion of involvement in the truck deaths. In a statement, police said 10 Baytami families have reported their relatives missing, fearing they were among the victims. Welcome back. In India, a public health emergency has been declared in New Delhi as the air quality index dips to 459 after Diwali celebrations. Schools in capital have been asked to stop all outdoor activities and sports until November the 5th. Authorities have also banned all kinds of construction activities and fireworks as a blanket of haze and smog shrouds the city. New Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has described the city as a gas chamber. After three venue changes, the United Nations 25th Climate Change Summit now appears to be headed to Madrid following Chile's withdrawal as the host. Chile pulled out just a month before the event amid riots that have paralyzed the capital city of Santiago. In a statement, the UN said Spain's government has offered to host the crucial meeting. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez says he will confirm a formal decision on Monday. Chilean President Sebastian Pinera said Madrid had offered to host the summit on the same schedule. The event will run between 2nd and 13 of December and will focus on the implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. Wildfires are raging across the Pantanal uh, tropical wetlands in southern Brazil. The government says the situation is critical and fires are bigger than anything seen before in the region. The authorities have announced a 30-day moratorium on using fire for land clearance. Raging wildfires have affected 125,000 acres. The National Risk Management Center says the fire was causing logistical difficulties due to poor visibility. Official figures show more than 167,000 forest fires blazed this year, including the Amazon fires in August. South California is braving a third day of a new wind-driven fires as the blazes burn through the San Bernardino National Forest. Evacuation orders have been issued for nearly 500 homes, displacing about 1,300 residents. The San Bernardino County Fire Department said cause of the blaze is still under investigation. National Weather Service handed out an extreme red flag warning in light of the recurrence of Santa Ana winds. But weather agency said no further winds are predicted for at least the next week. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned with the news. In the Somali capital of Mogadishu, people are trying to rebuild their lives despite conflict and regular terrorist attacks. New businesses like a floating bar and a restaurant are attempting to breathe life into the war-torn country and bolster the growing tourism sector. This report has more. Young people play football on the beach in Mogadishu. Others meet with friends to sing and eat together in a park. Despite the ongoing conflict in the capital, Somalis are looking for quiet places to relax. Abdul Qadir Ibrahim fled the conflict to Italy in the 70s, but after 10 years abroad, he decided to return to the country to create his own business, a floating bar and restaurant. When I saw in developed countries that there were boats with bars on tourist beaches, I thought it would be a great idea to create a floating restaurant here too. Several restaurants have sprung up on Lido Beach since the Al-Shabaab terrorist group was driven out of the city by African Union soldiers in 2011. The beach, just one of the few public spaces in the city, has risen in popularity. But this has also made it a target for the Al-Shabaab militants who continue to hit the capital regularly. In 2016, an attack on a waterfront restaurant left 19 dead. 
Mogadishu is a resilient city where buildings destroyed by suicide cars are quickly rebuilt and the youth is afraid of nothing and lives in peace. Despite tensions, many businesses are emerging in the Somali capital. The country is slowly trying to change its image and it is making inroads. In recent years, many foreign airlines have started to offer flights to Somalia. Australia's Qantas Airways has removed three of its Boeing 737 NG planes after finding structural cracks. Domestic CAO Andrew David says these were discovered during earlier than required aircraft checks as part of a global issue with the model. The cracks are on what is known as the pickle fork, a part that attaches the plane's fuselage or body to the wing structure. The new difficulties compound the US plane maker's problems. It faces tumbling profits federal scrutiny and calls for its CEO to resign after deadly crashes involving the 737 MAX, the successor to the 737NG. In Iraq, the anti-government protesters in Baghdad have taken to social media platforms to reach the world. Protesters live stream from their camps to counter state media and tell their version of the story. Details in this report. Throughout Tehrir Square, protesters can be seen filming on their phones to post on Facebook or Instagram. They share latest news on social media because many have stopped trusting conventional outlets. I uploaded more than one post in English so that the people can see what's happening here at the exact time and day. Because governmental news authorities is always against the protests. They threatened to kill my mother if I didn't stop posting. Many even live stream news from the sites challenging government bans on media outlets. Activists say they are also trying to keep the atmosphere convivial through social media. We want to relay the image of life and messages of coexistence and peace that is found in hymns, slogans, food distributions and peaceful messages in Tahrir Square. Young people, making up to 60% of Iraq's 40 million people, are hardly represented in its political class but rule the Hrir Square, which is the focal point of protests that denounce corruption, unemployment and call for the overthrow of the current political system. In Hong Kong, a man on Shuang Shao Island is charming tourists with art pieces made from candy. Visitors can stop and watch him sculpt sugar into a range of different animals and fantastical creatures. For more, watch this report. Using a pair of scissors, a blowpipe and small metal tools, Hong Kong shopkeeper Lois To whittles a chunk of molten sugar into a dragon toy. It is a technique he learned during China's Cultural Revolution. During this period, there was no food, there was nothing. I didn't have any toys when I was a kid, so I had to make whatever I wanted. His shop is full of candy bars, lollipops and intricately carved animal toys, from golden fish to a dragonfly. To remembers a local sugar sculptor in his neighborhood who would turn candies into works of art, as if by magic. I had no money to buy candies, but I watched the craftsman make them, how he used the scissors. I feel all those details are just right in front of me. With no recipes to guide him, To started experimenting himself, melting all kinds of sugars. Eventually, he struck the right technique. I had blisters on my hands. There was one week I almost gave up. For many customers, the store isn't just about the candy inside, but the amazing art studio. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned with the news. China has launched the world's largest 5G network as the country seeks to become a global technology leader. State media says 5G commercial services are now available in 50 cities including Beijing and Shanghai. The government said over 130,000 5G base stations will be activated by the end of the year to support the 5G network. 5G is the fifth generation of mobile internet connectivity. It promises much faster data download and upload speeds, wider coverage and more stable connections. 
Stock markets across Europe are trading higher on the back of a surprise bounce in China's manufacturing activity. Investors were cautious earlier amid concerns about the progress in U.S.-China trade talks due to conflicting tones. London's FTSE 100 index is trading over a fraction higher as Europe's basic resources stocks with their heavy exposures to China led the gains. The CAC 40 in Paris and Frankfurt's DAX index have also gained nearly half a percent. In Asia, the Shanghai Composite closed nearly 1% higher after data showed Chinese manufacturing activity expanded more than expected in October. Hong Kong's Hang Seng picked up over half a percent as shares of developer ESR came and jumped on its public debut. Source Cosby also closed over half a percent higher. And now the weather situation from around the globe. And that's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indestalkings.